Look, let's not make this weird. Whenever topics like these come up, they always lack important context and seem to be riddled with unintentional anachronistic talking points. I don't blame anyone for viewing history, even recent history, through a modern lens, especially for you Zoomers out there who weren't around before the internet. The world that you live in, the modern world, has shaped your beliefs and understanding of reality, which is fine for understanding the modern world. However, with that being said, I hope you'll understand why I want to provide some context before we bring the discussion to the Ninja Turtles. So let's go all the way back to the 1940s, a time when MGM and Warner Bros. dominated the genre of funny talking animal characters. The legendary Tex Avery was at his prime. The fucking Looney Tunes were shaping up into the characters that we know them to be today. Droopy was created, a classic. And all the while, World War II was at its peak and millions of people were dying fighting in a brother war. So yeah, it was a great time all around, you know, just fantastic times. <laughs> But seriously, part of what made the 1940s great was that there weren't any fucking creeps around. Yeah, those motherfuckers were sent straight to the loony bin. And when I say loony, I mean literally, creeps back then were deemed loony. Just look at the loony tunes. Bugs Bunny was deemed certifiably insane because he was willing to wear women's clothing and makeup. It was just understood that you'd have to be an absolute insane freak to wear a dress as a man. And most importantly, it was funny. Bugs Bunny wearing a dress wasn't a statement on trans rights or an endorsement of cross-dressing. But at the same time, it wasn't really a malicious anti-LGBT statement either. That wasn't even in the public consciousness. It wasn't making any sort of statement at all. It wasn't political. It wasn't controversial. It was just funny. An animal, a male animal, wearing a dress as a disguise to fool people? It was a funny scenario. And the fact that it was a talking animal doing it made the entire situation more absurd and detached from reality, and thus funny. Now look, if you wanted to, you could mind fuck yourself to make it be a big deal that Bugs Bunny wore a dress. You could reason that, well, if it's funny that Bugs Bunny wore a dress, then that means Bugs shouldn't wear a dress. And that's because he's a man, and if he's a man, well, that means he has male biology. And this line of thinking can get pretty graphic and gross, but nobody's mind ever went there. It wasn't until the age of the internet where degenerate fandoms were able to fester on these disturbing particulars, in large numbers, of course, you know, these people have always been around to some extent, but it wasn't assumed that Bugs Bunny had male biology or not. Most people weren't thinking about that. It was just a funny cartoon, you sick fuck. And similarly, nobody thought the 1943 classic Red Hot Riding Hood was disturbing either. Yes, an adult version of the Red Riding Hood was an attractive performer at a nightclub, and yes, the Big Bad Wolf's eyes popped out and he was clearly attracted to the performer, and so what? It was just a funny situation. Nobody had erotic images flashing through their heads of the wolf and Red Riding Hood together. If anything, people were just thinking, yeah, she's pretty hot and I can totally understand the reaction of the wolf. And that is really where the line was drawn and has been drawn for decades up until the modern age. Depictions of funny animal characters having an interest in human characters was fine as long as it was done for the purposes of comedy or irony or a depiction of a relatable crush or something like that. So in other words, comedy, irony, crushes, unrequited attraction, and those sorts of depictions were all fine. But depictions of a serious relationship or an intimate platonic adult relationship 
between an animal character and a human were always uncommon and in most cases would have always been seen as kind of weird. So for me, I've always felt like that's where the line was kind of drawn between acceptability and too creepy. And for the most part, I think these standards are fine. And fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise has examples of both types of depictions, both good and bad. Originally, Eastman and Laird took what I believe is the safest approach. The Turtles didn't really have any attraction to April. In issue number 4, after April got a perm, Raphael said, Wow, you look great. But he thought to himself, for a human. However, a few years later in 1988, we got the first crush from one of the turtles on a human. B -b Batataruzu, Batataruzu, Jana isn't a human, she's an alien. I was getting to that. I was going to say that while not technically human, you could say that the characters I'm about to discuss are humanoid or human-like aliens, which is close enough in my book. In issue number 13, by the great Michael Dooney, readers were introduced to the evil queen Moriah and a woman named Janna. If you are only familiar with these characters from the O3 series, note that they were much more human and much less blue in the original comic. But anyway, as the story goes, a ship fell to Earth with an unconscious Janna inside. Meanwhile, a ship with the evil queen and some alien creatures started heading toward Earth after her with talk about an election. As it turned out, Janna had won an election against the evil queen Mariah, but Mariah was a dirty fucking rigger. Hold on guys, that's rigger with an R, okay? She's basically trying to rig the election by murdering Mariah. Okay, that's not really the full truth. Basically, Mariah needs to defeat Janna in combat to maintain power, but she is cheating by using henchmen to help her instead of having a one-on-one -on -one battle. So the turtles took care of the henchmen so Janna and the rigger Mariah could have a little cat fight. After Janna spared Mariah's life, she left some of her hair behind for Donatello, who held her hair and looked lovingly toward the sky. Really, Donnie? Come on. Clearly, Mariah is the better option out of the two women. But seriously, this is the kind of crush that I think is perfectly acceptable in a TMNT story. Yeah, you can say it's weird because Donnie is a turtle, but it was just a crush and that's all it ever was. It wasn't ever going to go anywhere and for the most part, it seemed like it was one-sided anyway. If you take away anything creepy or weird from this, then the problem is you, not the story, in my opinion. Like I said, it was just an innocent crush, and there's not much more to glean from this. It's also worth noting that the O3 show took the safe route in their adaptation of this story by eliminating Donnie's crush. Janna still left some of her hair behind, I guess because Janna was a little bit closer to Donnie than the others, but Donnie didn't have that same smitten look as he did in the Mirage comics. And that's understandable because Laird made sure to keep the show free of any potential turtle-human chemistry, which would explain why the original issues, such as issue number 4, had the turtles not showing any attraction toward humans. Laird's feelings on this topic were confirmed on his blog. After Karai was introduced in the O3 show, the writers wanted Raphael to tease Leo about Karai being his quote, girlfriend, but Peter Laird was really against it. In a comment published by Laird, originally to Lloyd Goldfine, the head writer for the show, Peter Laird wrote, I'm starting to get an icky feeling whenever I see one of these Leo girlfriend lines from Raph. 
Just to check that we're all on the same page here, contrary to what some TMNT fans might fantasize, turtles don't mate slash have love affairs with humans, right? Why don't we have him just say Leo's pal or Leo's buddy instead? Peter Laird had amazing foresight here. He knew exactly what the fans would do with a line like this, they would twist it and use it as evidence that a Leo slash Karai relationship was canon. And so I can see where he was coming from. Personally, I like when the turtles are alone without any love interests, including uh, and especially human love interests. It's part of the reason why I hold issue number 28, Sons of the Silent Age, in such high regard. It was so great. It's exactly the kind of pensive story that is perfect for the TMNT. Giving the turtles love interests completely deflates the existential tragedy of mutation. It takes away a brilliant and relatively unique trope in exchange for more romance stories. That's a horrible trade. And of course, all of that goes without saying what Peter Laird was really getting at. He was just saying that it's kind of gross for a turtle and a human to be together. Yeah, understandable. But still, all of that aside, I realize that I can't always have it my way and the turtles can't always be incels like in issue number 1 or issue number 28. Sometimes we get stuff like issue number 13, the people's choice, and overall, Despite Peter Laird's objection to any turtle-human chemistry of any kind whatsoever, I really don't think Donnie's crush on Janna in issue number 13 was that creepy, and I think it fell perfectly in line with what was considered perfectly acceptable for decades, and in line with what I personally consider perfectly acceptable. After all, it's not like 2012 Donnie and his obsession with April. As a side note, we had a great post on Tataruzu.com about 2012 Donnie by Leonardo1984 if you want to go check it out and join the discussion. But anyway, in case you somehow weren't aware, in the 2012 series, April was a teenager like the Turtles, and Donnie had a huge crush on April, and it was kind of a running gag. It was an over-the-top crush where Donnie would do things like stalk April and then nervously play it off when he's caught. He had pictures of her, he'd have Freudian slips and say things like, My April. It was just a running joke that went on and on. A lot of people have a problem with this, but really, it's just a case of comedic, unrequited love. I think that falls into the category of acceptable. I think if it was just a one-off joke and not a major character trait that was played out over and over and over again, nobody would have really complained that much. The problem really isn't the creepiness of a turtle having a crush on a human. Again, nobody complained about the 40s Red Riding Hood animation from MGM. The problem is the fact that it was so unimaginably cringe and the show doubled down on this particular character trait. It's not like anything between Donnie and April could have actually happened, right? Well, it does make it feel a little bit more possible, considering the fact that they were both teenagers for this show. I think it would have been far less creepy, and it would have been made more clear that nothing could have happened between them if April was much older. You see that trope all the time, a younger kid falling for the older girl. But everyone knows it couldn't work out because the guy is way too young. If they really wanted to pursue the whole crush idea, this would have been the way to do it. It also would have avoided the teenage April trend that this show started. But 2012 Donnie isn't as egregious as, I hate to say it guys, Mirage Leo. They did my man Leo dirty guys. I hinted at this in the last video, 
but in Tales of the TMNT Volume 2, Issue Number 41, Swan Song, a relationship was formed between Leonardo and the Native American human woman, Radical. Yeah, this is crossing a line. If there was a line, th this, this is it, that's it right there. And this line is thoroughly crossed. Leo said, We understood each other completely, connected in ways I had always yearned for, but never thought possible. We folded into each other and didn't let go, just as one season holds on to and then yields to the next, we became as one. It was as if our two bodies- Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. What is this? Some kind of joke? Who wrote this shit? Who fucking wrote this? What? Wait, is that Stephen Murphy? No. No, no, no. This, this can't be. The man who wrote Sons of the Silent Age which I was praising so much earlier? This is some true yin and yang shit. This is the duality of man. <laughs> oh my god. He wrote the two versions of the Mirage Turtles that could not be further apart from each other. Okay, but who did the art? Who is this Steph Dumay person? Steph must be some kind of dainty ass woman who'd write something like this, right? Nope, it's a bald-ass Canadian man who writes brutal horror comics. Okay, I'm convinced. This issue is just a joke. There's no way that these two guys came together and made this seriously and unironically. Copium aside, at least Peter Laird confirmed that he had no fucking idea that this was happening. He said, I have to admit, with a bit of embarrassment, that there are some Tales of the TMNT stories which I have not read or even reviewed the premises for, and that I believe is one of them, so I can't really comment on that. I will say this though, I've never been a fan of the human slash turtle love story thing. What the fuck, Peter? You were the editor-in-chief! What were you doing, you lazy fuck? It's not like you were in the middle of a big TV show that is widely recognized as the best TMNT show ever written or anything like that. Not busy at all, nope. Alright, I'll give you the pass on this one, Pete. The 2003 show was goaded, and it's probably good that you gave it your full attention. I can only imagine how shit it would have been if you weren't there for it, and instead tending to the tales of the TMNT. Anyway, I've talked a lot about turtle-human relationships in this video. Feel free to let me know what you think about all of this in the comments down below. I'm sure the comments will be perfectly normal, and none of the discussions will be creepy or weird at all. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.